Bethlehem Royal Hospital, Wikipedia article audio. Coordinates, 51 degree 22 51, and 0 degree 0 1 50, W, slash, 51.3809 degrees north 0 0.0306 degrees west, slash 51.3809, 0 0.0306 Bethlehem Royal Hospital, also known as St. Mary Bethlehem, Bethlehem Hospital and Bedlam, is a psychiatric hospital in London. Its famous history has inspired several horror books, films and TV series, most notably Bedlam, a 1946 film with Boris Karloff. It has moved three times from its original location, and is Europe's first and oldest institution to specialize in mental illnesses. 1247-1633 Foundation The hospital is closely associated with King's College London and, in partnership with the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, is a major centre for psychiatric research. It is part of the King's Health Partners Academic Health Science Centre and the NIHR Biomedical Research Centre for Mental Health. Originally the hospital was near Bishopsgate just outside the walls of the City of London. It moved outside of Moorfields in the 17th century, then to St George's Fields in Southwark in the 19th century before moving to its current location at Monk's Orchard in West Wickham in 1930. The word bedlam, meaning uproar and confusion, is derived from the hospital's prior nickname. Although the hospital became a modern psychiatric facility, historically it was representative of the worst excesses of asylums in the era of lunacy reform. The hospital was founded in 1247 as the Priory of the New Order of Our Lady of Bethlehem in the City of London during the reign of Henry III. It was established by the Bishop-elect of Bethlehem, the Italian Goffredo de Prefetti, following a donation of personal property by the London Alderman and former Sheriff, Simon Fitzmary. The original location was in the parish of St. Botolph, Bishop's Gate S. Ward, just beyond London's Wall and where the southeast corner of Liverpool Street Station now stands. Bethlehem was not initially intended as a hospital, in the clinical sense, much less as a specialist institution for the insane, but as a centre for the collection of alms to support the Crusader Church and to link England to the Holy Land. De Prefetti's need to generate income for the Crusader Church and restore the financial fortunes of his see had been occasioned by two misfortunes, his bishopric had suffered significant losses following the destructive conquest of Bethlehem by the Khwarazman Turks in 1244, and his immediate predecessor had further impoverished his cathedral chapter through the alienation of a considerable amount of its property. The Priory, obedient to the Church of Bethlehem, would also house the poor and, if they visited, provide hospitality to the bishop, canons and brothers of Bethlehem. Thus, Bethlehem became a hospital, in medieval usage, an institution supported by charity or taxes for the care of the needy. The subordination of the Priory's religious order to the bishops of Bethlehem was further underlined in the Foundational Charter, which stipulated that the prior, canons and inmates were to wear a star upon their cloaks and capes to symbolize their obedience to the Church of Bethlehem. During the 13th and 14th centuries, with its activities underwritten by episcopal and papal indulgences, the hospital's role as a centre for alms collection persisted, but its linkage to the Order of Bethlehem increasingly unravelled, putting its purpose and patronage in doubt. In 1346 the Master of Bethlehem, 
a position at that time granted to the most senior of London's Bethlehemite brethren, applied to the city authorities seeking protection, thereafter metropolitan office holders claimed power to oversee the appointment of masters and demanded in return an annual payment of 40 shillings. It is doubtful whether the city really provided substantial protection and much less that the mastership fell within their patronage but, dating from the 1346 petition, it played a role in the management of Bethlehem's finances. By this time the Bethlehemite bishops had relocated to Claimsey, France, under the surety of the Avignon Papacy. This was significant as, Throughout the reign of Edward III, the English monarchy had extended its patronage over ecclesiastical positions through the seizure of priories under the control of non-English religious houses. As a dependent house of the Order of St. Bethlehem in Claimsey, Bethlehem was vulnerable to seizure by the Crown and this occurred in the 1370s when Edward III took control. The purpose of this appropriation was, in the context of the Hundred Years' War between France and England, to prevent funds raised by the hospital from enriching the French monarchy via the papal court. After this event the masters of the hospital, semi-autonomous figures in charge of its day-to-day -day management, were normally crown appointees and it became an increasingly secularist institution. The memory of its foundation became mudded and muddled, in 1381 the royal candidate for the post of master claimed that from its beginnings it had been superintended by an order of knights and he confused its founder, Gafredo de Prefetti, with the Frankish crusader, Godfrey de Bouillon. The removal of the last symbolic link to the Bethlehemites was confirmed in 1403 when it was reported that master and inmates no longer wore the Star of Bethlehem. Politics and Patronage In 1546 the Lord Mayor of London, Sir John Gresham, petitioned the Crown to grant Bethlehem to the city. This petition was partially successful and Henry VIII reluctantly ceded to the City of London the custody, order and governance of the hospital and of its occupants and revenues. This charter came into effect in 1547. The Crown retained possession of the hospital while its administration fell to the city authorities. Following a brief interval when it was placed under the management of the Governors of Christ's Hospital, from 1557 it was administered by the Governors of Bridewell, a prototype house of correction at Blackfriars. Having been thus one of the few metropolitan hospitals to have survived the dissolution of the monasteries physically intact, this joint administration continued not without interference by both the Crown and City, until incorporation into the National Health Service in 1948. It is Europe's oldest extant psychiatric hospital and has operated continuously for over 600 years. It has also been the continent's most famous, and infamous, specialist institution for the care and treatment of the insane. Its popular designation Bedlam has long been synonymous with madness. Precisely dating its transition to this role is difficult. From 1330 it was routinely referred to as a hospital but that does not necessarily indicate a change in its primary role from alms collection the word hospital could as likely have been used to denote a lodging for travelers, equivalent to a hostel and could have described an institution acting as a center and providing accommodation for peregrinating alms seekers or questors. It is unknown when it began to specialize in the care and control of the insane, but it has been frequently asserted that Bethlehem was first used for the insane from 1377. This date is derived from the unsubstantiated conjecture of the Reverend Edward Jeffrey O'Donohue, chaplain to the hospital, who published a monograph on its history in 1914. 
while it is possible that Bethlehem was receiving the insane during the late 14th century, the first definitive record of their presence in the hospital is in the details of a visitation of the charity commissioners in 1403. This recorded that amongst other patients there were six male inmates who were meant capti, a Latin term indicating insanity. The report of the visitation also noted the presence of four pairs of manacles, eleven chains, six locks and two pairs of stocks but it is not clear if any or all of these items were for the restraint of the inmates. While mechanical restraint and solitary confinement are likely to have been used for those regarded as dangerous, little else is known of the actual treatment of the insane for much of the medieval period. The presence of a small number of insane patients in 1403 marks Bethlehem's gradual transition from a diminutive general hospital into a specialist institution for the confinement of the insane. This process was largely completed by 1460. From Bethlehem to Bedlam From the 14th century Bethlehem had been referred to colloquially as Bethlehem, Bedlehem, or Bedlam. Initially Bedlam was an informal name but from approximately the Jacobean era the word entered everyday speech to signify a state of madness, chaos, and the irrational nature of the world. This development was partly due to Bedlam's staging in several plays of the Jacobean and Caroline periods, including The Honest Whore, Part I, Northward Ho, the Duchess of Malphi, the Pilgrim, and the Changeling. This dramatic interest in Bedlam is also evident in references to it in early 17th century plays such as Epicene, or The Silent Woman, Bartholomew Fair, and A New Way to Pay Old Debts. The appropriation of Bedlam as a theatrical locale for the depiction of madness probably owes no little debt to the establishment in 1576 in nearby Moorfields of the Curtain and the Theatre, two of the main London playhouses, it may also have been coincident with that other theatricalization of madness as charitable object, the commencement of public visiting at Bethlehem. The position of master was a sinecure largely regarded by its occupants as means of profiting at the expense of the poor in their charge. The appointment of the masters, later known as keepers, had lain within the patronage of the crown until 1547. Thereafter the city, through the court of aldermen, took control and, as with the king's appointees, the office was used to reward loyal servants and friends. Compared to the masters placed by the monarch, those who gained the position through the city were of much more modest status. In 1561 the Lord Mayor succeeded in having his former porter, Richard Munns, a draper by trade, appointed to the position. The sole qualification of his successor in 1565, a man by the name of Edward Rest, appears to have been his occupation as a grocer. Rest died in 1571, at which point the keepership passed on to John Mell in 1576, known for his abuse of the governors, those who gave money to the poor and the poor themselves. The Bridewell governors largely interpreted the role of keeper as that of a house manager and this is clearly reflected in the occupations of most appointees as they tended to be innkeepers, vittlers, or brewers and the like. When patients were sent to Bethlehem by the governors of the Bridewell the keeper was paid from hospital funds. For the remainder, Keepers were paid either by the families and friends of inmates or by the parish authorities. It is possible that keepers negotiated their fees for these latter categories of patients. John Mell's death in 1579 left the keepership open for the long-term keeper Roland Slaford, a London cloth maker, who left his post in 1598 
apparently of his own volition, after a 19-year tenure. Two months later, the Bridewell governors, who had until then shown little interest in the management of Bethlehem beyond the appointment of keepers, conducted an inspection of the hospital and a census of its inhabitants for the first time in over 40 years. Their purpose was to view and puse the defaults and want of repacons. They found that during the period of Slifford's keepership the hospital buildings had fallen into a deplorable condition with the roof caving in and the kitchen sink blocked, and reported that, it is not fit for any man to dwell in WCH was left by the keeper for that it is so loathsomely filthily kept not fit for any man to come into the house. Management The Committee of Inspection found 21 inmates with only two having been admitted during the previous 12 months. Of the remainder, six at least had been resident for a minimum of eight years and one inmate had been there for around 25 years. Three were from outside London, six were charitable cases paid for out of the hospital's resources one was supported by a parochial authority, and the rest were provided for by family, friends, benefactors or, in one instance, out of their own funds. The reason for the governor's newfound interest in Bethlehem is unknown but it may have been connected to the increased scrutiny the hospital was coming under with the passing of poor law legislation in 1598 and to the decision by the governors to increase hospital revenues by opening it up to general visitors as a spectacle. After this inspection, the governors initiated some repairs and visited the hospital at more frequent intervals. During one such visit in 1607 they ordered the purchase of clothing and eating vessels for the inmates, presumably indicating the lack of such basic items. Hell Kia Crook At the bidding of James VI and I, Hell Kia Crook was appointed keeper physician in 1619. As a Cambridge graduate, the author of an enormously successful English-language book of anatomy entitled Microcosmographia, a description of the body of man and a member of the medical department of the royal household, he was clearly of higher social status than his city-appointed predecessors. Crook had successfully ousted the previous keeper, the layman Thomas Jenner, after a campaign in which he had castigated his rival for being unskillful in the practice of medicine. While this may appear to provide evidence of the early recognition by the governors that the inmates of Bethlehem required medical care, the formal conditions of Crook's appointment did not detail any required medical duties. Indeed, the Board of Governors continued to refer to the inmates as the poor or prisoners and their first designation as patients appears to have been by the Privy Council in 1630. Conditions From 1619, Crook unsuccessfully campaigned through petition to the King for Bethlehem to become an independent institution from the Bridewell a move that while likely meant to serve both monarchial and personal interest would bring him into conflict with the Bridewell governors. Following a pattern of management laid down by early office holders, his tenure as keeper was distinguished by his irregular attendance at the hospital and the avid appropriation of its funds as his own. Such were the depredations of his regime that an inspection by the governors in 1631 reported that the patients were likely to starve. Charges against his conduct were brought before the governors in 1632. Crook's royal favor having dissolved with the death of James I, Charles I instigated an investigation against him in the same year. This established his absenteeism and embezzlement of hospital resources and charged him with failing to pursue any endeavor for the curing of the distracted persons. It also revealed that charitable goods and hospital purchased foodstuffs intended for patients had been typically misappropriated by the hospital steward, 
either for his own use or to be sold to the inmates. If patients lacked resources to trade with the steward they often went hungry. These findings resulted in the dismissal and disgrace of Crook, the last of the old-style keepers, along with his steward on May 24, 1633. In 1632 it was recorded that the old house of Bethlehem had below stairs a parlor, a kitchen, two larders, a long entry throughout the house, and twenty-one rooms wherein the poor distracted people lie, and above the stairs eight rooms more for servants and the poor to lie in. It is likely that this arrangement was not significantly different in the 16th century. Although inmates, if deemed dangerous or disturbing, were chained up or locked up, Bethlehem was an otherwise open building with its inhabitants at liberty to roam around its confines and possibly the local neighborhood. The neighboring inhabitants would have been quite familiar with the condition of the hospital as in the 1560s, and probably for some considerable time before that. Those who lacked a lavatory in their own homes had to walk through the west end of the long house of Bethlehem to access the rear of the hospital and reach the common Jacques. Typically the hospital appears to have been a receptacle for the very disturbed and troublesome and this fact lends some credence to accounts such as that provided by Donald Lupton in the 1630s who described the cryings, screechings, roarings, brawlings shaking of shins, swearings, frettings, chaffings that he observed. 1634-1791 Bethlehem had been built over a sewer that served both the hospital and its precinct. This common drain regularly blocked and resulting in overflows of waste at the entrance of the hospital. The 1598 visitation by the governors had observed that the hospital was filthily kept, but the governors rarely made any reference to the need for staff to clean the hospital. The level of hygiene reflected the inadequate water supply, which, until its replacement in 1657, consisted of a single wooden cistern in the backyard from which water had to be laboriously transported by bucket. In the same yard since at least the early 17th century there was a wash house to clean patients' clothes and bedclothes and in 1669 a drying room for clothes was added. Patients, if capable, were permitted to use the house of easement, of which there were two at most but more frequently piss pots were used in their cells. Unsurprisingly, inmates left to brood in their cells with their own excreta were, on occasion, liable to throw such filth and excrement into the hospital yard or onto staff and visitors. Lack of facilities combined with patient incontinence and prevalent conceptions of the mad as animalistic and dirty, fit to be kept on a bed of straw appear to have promoted an acceptance of hospital squalor. However, this was an age with very different standards of public and personal hygiene when people typically were quite willing to urinate or defecate in the street or even in their own fireplaces. For much of the 17th century the dietary provision for patients appears to have been inadequate. This was especially so during Crook's regime when inspection found several patients suffering from starvation. Corrupt staff practices were evidently a significant factor in patient malnourishment and similar abuses were noted in the 1650s and 1670s. The governors failed to manage the supply of vittles, relying on gifts in kind for basic provisions and the resources available to the steward to purchase foodstuffs was dependent upon the goodwill of the keeper. Patients were fed twice a day on a lowering diet consisting of bread, meat, oatmeal, butter, cheese, and generous amounts of beer. It is likely that daily meals alternated between meat and dairy products, almost entirely lacking in fruit or vegetables. 
that the portions appear to have been inadequate also likely reflected contemporary humoral theory that justified rationing the diet of the mad, the avoidance of rich foods, and a therapeutics of depletion and purgation to restore the body to balance and restrain the spirits. The year 1634 is typically interpreted as denoting the divide between the medieval and early modern administration of Bethlehem. It marked the end of the day-to-day -day management by an old-style keeper physician and its replacement by a three-tiered medical regime composed of a non-resident physician, a visiting surgeon and an apothecary, a model adopted from the royal hospitals. The medical staff were elected by the Court of Governors and, in a bid to prevent profiteering at the expense of patients that had reached its apogee in Crook's era, they were all eventually salaried with limited responsibility for the financial affairs of the hospital. Personal connections, interests, and occasionally royal favor were pivotal factors in the appointment of physicians but by the measure of the times appointees were well qualified as almost all were Oxbridge graduates and a significant number were either candidates or fellows of the College of Physicians. Although the posts were strongly contested, nepotistic appointment practices played a significant role. The election of James Monroe as physician in 1728 marked the beginning of an 125-year Monroe family dynasty extending through four generations of fathers and sons. Family influence was also significant in the appointment of surgeons but absent in that of apothecaries. The office of physician was largely an honorary and charitable one with only a nominal salary. As with most hospital posts, attendance was required only intermittently and the greater portion of the income was derived from private practice. Bethlehem physicians, maximizing their association with the hospital, typically earned their coin in the lucrative trade in lunacy with many acting as visiting physicians to, presiding over, or even, as with the Monroes and their predecessor Thomas Allen establishing their own madhouses. Initially both surgeons and apothecaries were also without salary and their hospital income was solely dependent upon their presentation of bills for attendance to the court of governors. This system was frequently abused and the bills presented were often deemed exorbitant by the board of governors. The problem of financial exploitation was partly rectified in 1676, when surgeons received a salary, and from the mid-18th century elected apothecaries were likewise salaried and normally resident within the hospital. Dating from this latter change, the vast majority of medical responsibilities within the institution were undertaken by the sole resident medical officer the apothecary, owing to the relatively irregular attendance of the physician and surgeon. The medical regime, being married to a depletive or antiphlogistic physic until the early 19th century, had a reputation for conservatism that was neither unearned nor, given the questionable benefit of some therapeutic innovations, necessarily ill-conceived in every instance. Bathing was introduced in the 1680s at a time when hydrotherapy was enjoying a recrudescence in popularity. Cold bathing, opined John Monroe, Bethlehem physician for 40 years from 1751, has in general an excellent effect, and remained much in vogue as a treatment throughout the 18th century. By the early 19th century, Bathing was routine for all patients of sufficient hardiness from summer to the setting in of the cold weather. Spring signaled recourse to the traditional armamentarium, from then until the end of summer Bethlehem's mad physique reigned supreme as all patients, barring those deemed incurable, could expect to be bled and blistered and then dosed with emetics and purgatives. Indiscriminately applied these curative measures were administered with the most cursory physical examination, if any, and with sufficient excess to risk not only health but also life. 
such was the violence of the standard medical course, involving voiding of the bowels, vomiting, scarification, sores and bruises, that patients were regularly discharged or refused admission if they were deemed unfit to survive the physical onslaught. Medical Regime The reigning medical ethos was the subject of public debate in the mid-18th century when a paper war erupted between John Monroe and his rival William Batty, physician to the reformist St. Luke's Asylum of London, founded in 1751. The Bethlehem governors, who had presided over the only public asylum in Britain until the early 18th century, looked upon St. Luke's as an upstart institution and Batty, formerly a governor at Bethlehem, as traitorous. In 1758 Batty published his treatise on madness which castigated Bethlehem as archaic and outmoded uncaring of its patients and founded upon a despairing medical system whose therapeutic transactions were both injudicious and unnecessarily violent. In contrast, Batty presented St. Luke's as a progressive and innovative hospital, orientated towards the possibility of cure and scientific in approach. Monroe responded promptly, publishing remarks on Dr. Batty's treatise on madness in the same year. Bethlehem rebuilt at Moorfields. Although Bethlehem had been enlarged by 1667 to accommodate 59 patients, the Court of Governors of Bethlehem and Bridewell observed at the start of 1674 that the Hospital House of Bethlehem is very old, weak and ruinous and too small and straight for keeping the greater number of lunatics therein att sent. With the increasing demand for admission and the inadequate and dilapidated state of the building it was decided to rebuild the hospital in Moorfields, just north of the city proper and one of the largest open spaces in London. The architect chosen for the new hospital, which was built rapidly and at great expense between 1675 and 1676 was the natural philosopher and city surveyor Robert Hooke. He constructed an edifice that was monumental in scale at over 500 feet wide and some 40 feet deep. The surrounding walls were some 680 feet long and 70 feet deep while the south face at the rear was effectively screened by a 714-foot stretch of London's ancient wall projecting westward from nearby Moorgate. At the rear and containing the courtyards where patients exercised and took the air, the walls rose to 14 feet high. The front walls were only 8 feet high but this was deemed sufficient as it was determined that lunatics are not to permitted to walk in the yard to be situate between the said intended new building and the wall aforesaid. It was also hoped that by keeping these walls relatively low the splendor of the new building would not be overly obscured. This concern to maximize the building's visibility led to the addition of six gated openings ten feet wide which punctuated the front wall at regular intervals, enabling views of the façade. Functioning as both advertisement and warning of what lay within, the stone pillars enclosing the entrance gates were capped by the figures of melancholy and raving madness carved in Portland stone by the Danish-born sculptor K.S. Gabriel Sibber. Committee on Madhouses First Report, Minutes of Evidence Taken Before the Select Committee Appointed to Consider of Provision Being Made for the Better Regulation of Madhouses in England London, House of Commons 1815, more, Thomas. The Four Last Things. Edited by D. O'Connor. London, Art and Book Co., 1903, Saucher, César de. A Foreign View of England in the Reigns of George I and II, The Letters of Monsieur César de Saucher to His Family. Edited and translated by Madame Van Witten. London, John Murray, 1902, Wakefield, Edward. 
Plan of an Asylum for Lunatics, N.C. The Philanthropist. 1812,2.226.29 At the instigation of the Bridewell Governors and to make a grander architectural statement of charitable munificence, the hospital was designed as a single rather than double-pile building, accommodating initially 120 patients. Having cells and chambers on only one side of the building facilitated the dimensions of the great galleries, essentially long and capacious corridors, 13 feet high and 16 feet wide, which ran the length of both floors to a total span of 1,179 feet. Such was their scale that Roger Lestrange remarked in a 1,676 text eulogising the new Bethlehem that their vast length, wearies the travelling eyes of strangers. The galleries were constructed more for public display than for the care of patients as, at least initially, inmates were prohibited from them lest such persons that come to see the said lunatics may go in danger of their lives. The architectural design of the new Bethlehem was primarily intended to project an image of the hospital and its governors consonant with contemporary notions of charity and benevolence. In an era prior to the state funding of hospitals and with patient fees covering only a portion of costs, such self-advertisement was necessary to win the donations, subscriptions and patronage essential for the institution's survival. This was particularly the case in raising funds to pay for major projects of expansion such as the rebuilding project at Moorfields or the addition of the Incurables Division in 1725-39 with accommodation for more than 100 patients. These highly visible acts of civic commitment could also serve to advance the claims to social status or political advantage of its governors and supporters. However, while consideration of patients' needs may have been distinctly secondary, they were not absent. For instance, both the placement of the hospital in the open space of Moorfields and the form of the building with its large cells and well-lit galleries had been chosen to provide health and air in accordance with the MIA's Matic theory of disease causation. It was London's first major charitable building since the Savoy Hospital and one of only a handful of public buildings then constructed in the aftermath of the Great Fire of London. It would be regarded, during this period at least, as one of the prime ornaments of the city, and a noble monument to charity. Not least due to the increase in visitor numbers that the new building allowed, the hospital's fame and latterly infamy grew and this magnificently expanded Bethlehem shaped English and international depictions of madness and its treatment. Public Visiting 1791-1900 Bethlehem rebuilt at St. George's Fields 1815-16 Parliamentary Inquiry Visits by friends and relatives were allowed and it was expected that the family and friends of poor inmates would bring food and other essentials for their survival. Bethlehem was and is best known for the fact that it also allowed public and casual visitors with no connection to the inmates. This display of madness as public show has often been considered the most scandalous feature of the historical Bedlam. On the basis of circumstantial evidence, it is speculated that the Bridewell governors may have decided as early as 1598 to allow public visitors as means of raising hospital income. The only other reference to visiting in the 16th century is provided in a comment in Thomas More's 1522 treatise, The Four Last Things where he observed that thou shalt in Bedlam see one laugh at the knocking of his head against a post. As more occupied a variety of official positions that might have occasioned his calling to the hospital and as he lived nearby, his visit provides no compelling evidence that public visitation was widespread during the 16th century. 
The first apparently definitive documentation of public visiting derives from a 1610 record which details Lord Percy's payment of 10 shillings for the privilege of rambling through the hospital to view its deranged denizens. It was also at this time, and perhaps not coincidentally, that Bedlam was first used as a stage setting with the publication of The Honest Whore, Part I, in 1604. Evidence that the number of visitors rose following the move to Moorfields is provided in the observation by the Bridewell Governors in 1681 of the great quantity of persons that come daily to see the said lunatics. Eight years later the English merchant and author, Thomas Tryon, remarked disapprovingly of the swarms of people that descended upon Bethlehem during public holidays. In the mid-18th century a journalist of a topical periodical noted that at one time during Easter week 100 people at least were to be found visiting Bethlehem's inmates. Evidently Bethlehem was a popular attraction, yet there is no credible basis to calculate the annual number of visitors. The claim, still sometimes made, that Bethlehem received 96,000 visitors annually is speculative in the extreme. Nevertheless, it has been established that the pattern of visiting was highly seasonal and concentrated around holiday periods. As Sunday visiting was severely curtailed in 1650 and banned seven years later, the peak periods became Christmas, Easter, and Whitsun. The governors actively sought out people of note and quality the educated, wealthy and well-bred as visitors. The limited evidence would suggest that the governors enjoyed some success in attracting such visitors of quality. In this elite and idealized model of charity and moral benevolence the necessity of spectacle, the showing of the mad so as to excite compassion, was a central component in the elicitation of donations, benefactions, and legacies. Nor was the practice of showing the poor and unfortunate to potential donators exclusive to Bethlehem as similar spectacles of misfortune were performed for public visitors to the Foundling Hospital and Magdalen Hospital for penitent prostitutes. The donations expected of visitors to Bethlehem there never was an official fee probably grew out of the monastic custom of almsgiving to the poor. While a substantial proportion of such monies undoubtedly found their way into the hands of staff rather than the hospital poor's box, Bethlehem profited considerably from such charity, collecting on average between £300 and £350 annually from the 1720s until the curtailment of visiting in 1770. Thereafter the poor's box monies declined to about £20 or £30 per year. Aside from its fundraising function, the spectacle of Bethlehem offered moral instruction for visiting strangers. For the educated observer Bedlam's theatre of the disturbed might operate as a cautionary tale providing a deterrent example of the dangers of immorality and vice. The mad on display functioned as a moral exemplum of what might happen if the passions and appetites were allowed to dethrone reason. As one mid-18th century correspondent commented, better lesson be taught us in any part of the globe than in this school of misery. Here we may see the mighty reasoners of the earth, below even the insects that crawl upon it, and from so humbling a sight we may learn to moderate our pride, and to keep those passions within bounds, which if too much indulged, would drive reason from her seat, and level us with the wretches of this unhappy mansion. Whether persons of quality or not, the primary allure for visiting strangers was neither moral edification nor the duty of charity but its entertainment value. In Roy Porter's memorable phrase, what drew them was the free zone of the freak show, where Bethlehem was a rare diversion to cheer and amuse. It became one of a series of destinations on the London tourist trail which included such sites as the Tower, the Zoo, Bartholomew Fair 
London Bridge and Whitehall. Curiosity about Bethlehem's attractions, its remarkable characters, including figures such as Nathaniel Lee, the dramatist, and Oliver Cromwell S. Porter, Daniel, was, at least until the end of the 18th century, quite a respectable motive for visiting. From 1770 free public access ended with the introduction of a system whereby visitors required a ticket signed by a governor. Visiting subjected Bethlehem's patients to many abuses, but its curtailment removed an important an element of public oversight. In the period thereafter, with staff practices less open to public scrutiny, the worst patient abuses occurred. 1900 to the present Despite its palatial pretensions, by the end of the 18th century Bethlehem was suffering physical deterioration with uneven floors, buckling walls, and a leaking roof. It resembled a crazy carcass with no wall still vertical a veritable Hogarthian auto-satire. The financial cost of maintaining the Moorfields building was onerous and the capacity of the governors to meet these demands was stymied by shortfalls in Bethlehem's income in the 1780s occasioned by the bankruptcy of its treasurer. Further monetary strains were imposed in the following decade by inflationary wage and provision costs in the context of the revolutionary wars with France. In 1791, Bethlehem's surveyor, Henry Holland, presented a report to the governors detailing an extensive list of the building's deficiencies including structural defects and uncleanliness and estimated that repairs would take five years to complete at a cost of £8,660. Only a fraction of this sum was allocated and by the end of the decade it was clear that the problem had been largely unaddressed. Holland's successor to the post of surveyor, James Lewis, was charged in 1799 with compiling a new report on the building's condition. Presenting his findings to the governors the following year, Lewis declared the building incurable and opined that further investment in anything other than essential repairs would be financially imprudent. He was, however, careful to insulate the governors from any criticism concerning Bethlehem's physical dilapidation as, rather than decrying either Hook's design or the structural impact of additions, he castigated the slipshod nature of its rapid construction. Lewis observed that it had been partly built on land called the Town Ditch, a receptacle for rubbish and this provided little support for a building whose span extended to over 500 feet. He also noted that the brickwork was not on any foundation but laid on the surface of the soil, a few inches below the present floor, while the walls, overburdened by the weight of the roofs, were neither sound, upright, nor level. While the logic of Lewis's report was clear, the Court of Governors, facing continuing financial difficulties, only resolved in 1803 behind the project of rebuilding on a new site, and a fundraising drive was initiated in 1804. In the interim, attempts were made to rehouse patients at local hospitals and admissions to Bethlehem, sections of which were deemed uninhabitable, were significantly curtailed such that the patient population fell from 266 in 1800 to 119 in 1814. Financial obstacles to the proposed move remain significant. A national press campaign to solicit donations from the public was launched in 1805. Parliament was successfully lobbied to provide £10,000 for the fund under an agreement whereby the Bethlehem governors would provide permanent accommodation for any lunatic soldiers or sailors of the French wars. Early interest in relocating the hospital to a site at Gossy Fields had to be abandoned due to financial constraints and stipulations in the lease for Moorfields that precluded its resale. Instead, 
the governors engaged in protracted negotiations with the city to swap the Moorfields site for another municipally owned location at St. George's Fields in Southwark, south of the Thames. The swap was concluded in 1810 and provided the governors with a 12 acres site in a swamp like, impoverished, highly populated, an industrial east area where the Dog and Duck Tavern and St. George's Spa had been. A competition was held to design the new hospital at Southwark in which the noted Bethlehem patient James Tilly Matthews was an unsuccessful entrant. The governors elected to give James Lewis the task. Incorporating the best elements from the three winning competition designs, he produced a building in the neoclassical style that, while drawing heavily on Hook's original plan, eschewed the ornament of its predecessor. Completed after three years in 1815, it was constructed during the first wave of county asylum building in England under the County Asylum Act of 1808. Extending to 580 feet in length, the new hospital, which ran alongside the Lambeth Road, consisted of a central block with two wings of three stories on either side. Female patients occupied the west wing and males the east, as at Moorfields, the cells were located off galleries that traversed each wing. Each gallery contained only one toilet, a sink, and cold baths. Incontinent patients were kept on beds of straw in cells in the basement gallery, this space also contained rooms with fireplaces for attendance. A wing for the criminally insane a legal category newly minted in the wake of the trial of a delusional James Hadfield for attempted regicide was completed in 1816. This addition, which housed 45 men and 15 women, was wholly financed by the state. 750th Anniversary and Reclaim Bedlam Campaign Recent Developments Recent Fatal Restraints The first 122 patients arrived in August 1815 having been transported to their new residence by a convoy of hackney coaches. Problems with the building were soon noted as the steam heating did not function properly, the basement galleries were damp and the windows of the upper stories were unglazed so that the sleeping cells were either exposed to the full blast of cold air or were completely darkened. Although glass was placed in the windows in 1816, the governors initially supported their decision to leave them unglazed on the basis that it provided ventilation and so prevented the build-up of the disagreeable effluvias peculiar to all madhouses. Faced with increased admissions and overcrowding, new buildings, designed by the architect Sidney Smirk, were added from the 1830s. The wing for criminal lunatics was increased to accommodate a further 30 men while additions to the east and west wings, extending the building's façade, provided space for an additional 166 inmates and a dome, providing a much-needed touch of grandeur, was added to the hospital chapel. At the end of this period of expansion Bethlehem had a capacity for 364 patients. The late 18th and early 19th centuries are typically seen as decisive in the emergence of new attitudes towards the management and treatment of the insane. Increasingly, the emphasis shifted from the external control of the mad through physical restraint and coercion to their moral management whereby self-discipline would be inculcated through a system of reward and punishment. For proponents of lunacy reform, the Quaker Run York Retreat, founded in 1796, functioned as an exemplar of this new approach that would seek to re-socialize and re-educate the mad. Bethlehem, embroiled in scandal from 1814 over its inmate conditions, would come to symbolize its antithesis. 
through newspaper reports initially and then evidence given to the 1815 Parliamentary Committee on Madhouses, the state of inmate care in Bethlehem was chiefly publicized by Edward Wakefield, a Quaker land agent and leading advocate of lunacy reform. He visited Bethlehem several times during the late spring and early summer of 1814. His inspections were of the old hospital at the Moorfields site, which was then in a state of disrepair, much of it was uninhabitable and the patient population had been significantly reduced. Contrary to the tenets of moral treatment, Wakefield found that the patients in the galleries were not classified in any logical manner as both highly disturbed and quiescent patients were mixed together indiscriminately. Later, when reporting on the chained and naked state of many patients, Wakefield sought to describe their conditions in such a way as to maximize the horror of the scene while decrying the apparently bestial treatment of inmates and the thuggish nature of the asylum keepers. Wakefield's account focused on one patient in particular, James Norris, an American Marine reported to be 55 years of age who had been detained in Bethlehem since February 1, 1800. Housed in the incurable wing of the hospital, Norris had been continuously restrained for about a decade in a harness apparatus which severely restricted his movement. Wakefield stated that, a stout iron ring was riveted about his neck, from which a short chain passed to a ring made to slide upwards and downwards on an upright massive iron bar, more than six feet high, inserted into the wall. Round his body a strong iron bar about two inches wide was riveted, on each side of the bar was a circular projection, which being fashioned to and enclosing each of his arms, pinioned them close to his sides. This waist bar was secured by two similar iron bars which, passing over his shoulders, were riveted to the waist both before and behind. The iron ring about his neck was connected to the bars on his shoulders by a double link. From each of these bars another short chain passed to the ring on the upright bar. He had remained thus encaged and chained more than twelve years. Wakefield's Revelations combined with earlier reports about patient maltreatment at the York Asylum, helped to prompt a renewed campaign for national lunacy reform and the establishment of an 1815 House of Commons Select Committee on Madhouses, which examined the conditions under which the insane were confined in county asylums, private madhouses, charitable asylums, and in the lunatic wards of poor law workhouses. Current Services In June 1816 Thomas Monroe, principal physician, resigned as a result of scandal when he was accused of wanting inhumanity towards his patients. Dr. T. B. Hislop came to the hospital in 1888 and rose to be physician in charge, bringing the hospital into the 20th century and retiring in 1911. In 1930, the hospital moved to an outer suburb of London, on the site of Monk's Orchard House between Eden Park, Beckenham, West Wickham, and Shirley. The old hospital and its grounds were bought by Lord Rothermere and presented to the London County Council for use as a park, the central part of the building was retained and became home to the Imperial War Museum in 1936. In 1997 the hospital started planning celebrations of its 750th anniversary. The service user's perspective was not to be included, however, and members of the psychiatric survivors' movement saw nothing to celebrate in either the original bedlam or in the current practices of mental health professionals towards those in need of care. A campaign called Reclaim Bedlam was launched by Pete Shaughnessy, supported by hundreds of patients and ex-patients and widely reported in the media. A sit-in was held outside the earlier Bedlam site at the Imperial War Museum.
the historian Roy Porter called the Bethlehem Hospital a symbol for man's inhumanity to man, for callousness and cruelty. Until the 1990s the hospital and its grounds were in the London borough of Croydon, but were swapped with the London borough of Bromley for South Norwood Country Park. In 1997, the Bethlehem Gallery was established to showcase the work of artists that have experienced mental distress. In 1999, Bethlehem Royal Hospital became part of the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, along with the Maudsley Hospital in Camberwell, and the merger of mental health services in Lambeth and Lewisham. In 2001 SLAM sought planning permission for an expanded medium secure unit in 2001 and extensive works to improve security, much of which would be on metropolitan open land. Local residents groups organized mass meetings to oppose the application, with accusations that it was unfair that most patients could be from inner London areas and therefore not locals and that drug use was rife in and around the hospital. Bromley Council refused the application, with Croydon Council also objecting. However the office of the Deputy Prime Minister overturned the decision in 2003 and development started. The 89-bed, £33.5 million unit opened in February 2008. It is the most significant development on the site since the hospital opened in 1930. It represents a major improvement in the quality of NHS care for people with mental health problems. The unit provides care for people who were previously being treated in hospitals up to 200 miles away from their families because of the historic shortage of medium secure beds in southeast London. This, in turn, was intended to help the NHS to manage people's progress through care and treatment more effectively. SLAM owns land throughout England, often left to it as a bequest. It owns a lease in Piccadilly for which it has paid the same peppercorn rent for over 200 years. This property is let out to shops and a hotel, which contributes to funding. Media Notable patients Olazerny Lewis aged 23 died in 2010 at Bethlehem Royal Hospital after police subjected him to prolonged restraint of a type known to be dangerous. Neither police nor medical staff intervened when Lewis became unresponsive. At coroner's inquest the jury found many failures by both police and medical staff which played a part in Lewis's death. They said the excessive force, pain compliance techniques and multiple mechanical restraints were disproportionate and unreasonable. On the balance of probability, this contributed to the cause of death. Ajibala Lewis, Olazerny Lewis's mother claimed a nurse at Maudsley Hospital where Lewis had been earlier warned against allowing his transfer to Bethlehem. She said to me, look. Don't let him go to the Bethlehem, don't let him go there, his mother said. A doctor later persuaded her to take her son to Bethlehem Hospital, she was concerned about the conditions there. It was a mess, she told the court, it was very confused, a lot of activity, a lot of shouting. I was not happy, I was confused. Police were trained to view Lewis's behavior as a medical emergency but the jury found police failed to act on this. The jury found that the police failed to follow their training, which requires them to place an unresponsive person into the recovery position and if necessary administer life support. On the balance of probability this also contributed to the cause of death. A doctor did not act when Lewis became unresponsive while his heart rate dramatically slowed. The Independent Police Complaints Commission first cleared officers over the death, but following pressure from the family they scrapped the conclusions and started a new inquiry. 
The IPCC is planning disciplinary action against some of the police officers involved. Deborah Coles of the charity Inquest, who has supported the Lewis family throughout their campaign, said the jury had reached the most damning possible conclusions on the actions of police and medics. This was a most horrific death. Eleven police officers were involved in holding down a terrified young man until his complete collapse, legs and hands bound in limb restraints, while mental health staff stood by. Officers knew the dangers of this restraint but chose to go against clear, unequivocal training. Evidence heard at this inquest begs the question of how racial stereotyping informed Sini's brutal treatment. Notes Footnotes Sources A disciplinary hearing conducted by the Metropolitan Police found the officers had not committed misconduct. The hearing was criticized by the family, because it was held behind closed doors with neither press nor public scrutiny. In 2014 Chris Brennan aged 15 died of asphyxiation while at Bethlehem Hospital after repeated self-harming. The coroner found lack of proper risk assessment and lack of a care plan contributed to his death. The hospital claimed staffing problems and low morale were factors. Lessons have been learned and the adolescent unit where Brennan died was recently assessed as good. In November 2017 a bill is being debated in the House of Commons that would require psychiatric hospitals to give more detailed information about how and when restraints are used. This bill is referred to as CNE's Law. The hospital includes specialist services such as the National Psychosis Unit. Other services include the Bethlehem Adolescent Unit which provides care and treatment for young people aged 12-18 from across the UK. The hospital has an occupational therapy department, which has its own art gallery, the Bethlehem Gallery, displaying work of current and former patients. The Bethlehem Museum of the Mind features exhibits about the history of Bethlehem Royal Hospital and the history of mental health care and treatment. It features a permanent collection of art created by some of its patients, as well as changing exhibitions. In 2013, the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust took part in a Channel 4 observational documentary, Bedlam. Staff and patients spent two years working with television company The Garden Productions. The four-part series started on October 31st. The first program, Anxiety, followed patients through the 18-bed Anxiety and Disorders Residential Unit. This national unit treats the most anxious people in the country, the top 1%, and claims a success rate of 3 in 4 patients. Some are consumed by irrational fears that they have caused a road accident in their sleep, harmed strangers, or have intrusive thoughts. The next program was called Crisis. Cameras were allowed in Lambeth Hospital's triage ward for the first time. In a postcode with the highest rates of psychosis in Europe, this is the accident and emergency of mental health, where patients are at their most unwell. The third program, Psychosis, films a community mental health team. South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust provides support for more than 35,000 people with mental health problems. The final program, Breakdown, focuses on older adults, including the inpatient ward for people over 65 with mental health problems at Maudsley Hospital. One of the side rooms contained about 10 patients, each chained by one arm to the wall, the chain allowing them merely to stand up by the bench or form fixed to the wall, or sit down on it. The nakedness of each patient was covered by a blanket only. 
Many other unfortunate women were locked up in their cells, naked and chained on straw. In the men's wing, in the side room, six patients were chained close to the wall by the right arm as well as by the right leg. Their nakedness and their mode of confinement gave the room the complete appearance of a dog kennel. Whilst looking at some of the bed-lying patients, a man arose naked from his bed, and had deliberately and quietly walked a few paces from his cell door along the gallery, he was instantly seized by the keepers, thrown in his bed, and leg-locked, without inquiry or observation, chains were universally substituted for the straight waistcoat. Primary Sources Secondary Sources